Hello everyone, welcome to the Zero Hiccup podcast and today we have between us Eric Elskern from Shipyard. Hi Eric, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, doing good as well and really excited for this podcast episode because, you know, the more I learn about Shipyard, the more excited about how you guys are at the center of technology trends today. So, uh, Eric, why not you talk a little bit more about uh, about yourself and about Shipyard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Eric Elskin. Uh, I have a background in computer science and uh, math. Um, those were always something that I was interested in growing up, and it's what I uh, got to study in college. And then um, my first role out of school um, was working for a company called PMG. They're a digital advertising agency. And uh, uh, while working there, I started working on a tool that kind of eventually became Shipyard. Um, it was an internal tool that uh, was primarily used by the data team at that company. And uh, my co-founder, Blake, uh, Blake Birch, and I um, uh, worked together there uh, quite a bit. And he was in charge of the data team, and um, I was the one writing that tool. So once that tool kind of gained widespread adoption, um, we worked with... Um, we worked with the company to spin off uh, the that tool into what is now Shipyard. Um, so we've been doing the Shipyard thing um, for a little over three years now. Um, and then our product's been available or open to the public um, for a little over two years as well. And um, yeah, at Shipyard, we just, uh, we want to be the easiest way for uh, data teams to launch, monitor, and share uh, workflow, workflow solutions um, to integrate anywhere in the data stack that um, that data teams see fit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, primary audience for you, Eric, is selling it to the developers, like are they the end users or uh, is it usually the company, uh, you know, business teams that usually buy your products? How do you see your selling cycle? Yeah, I mean, we, we're available for both. Um, we we don't want to shy away from uh, selling to or having users that are technical uh, versus non technical. Um, however, we do uh, we do see more uh, kind of more benefits maybe for the non technical users or the non like data engineering team. So um, the business users. Uh, but what we want is for our application to. Uh, kind of empower the data teams to put everything together in such a way that the end consumers or the business users um, can understand and use the platform um, without having to bug or annoy or interfere with the data operations. Um, so we we do allow for uh, custom code and running your own code. Um, so that is where more of the engineering or the data mindset or the technical mindset comes into play. But we also have uh, plenty of low code solutions. Um, so it's kind of like a low code plus uh, platform where you can bring your own solution or you can use uh, plenty of the low code solutions that we already have. Um, and that kind of speaks more to the, uh, the non-technical aspect or the business use case. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're happy to service both. Um, but as we see it right now, uh, we we definitely um, kind of get more uh, buy-in from the from the business users. Okay, so uh, please expand more, Eric. Like, uh, uh, how does Shipyard does its magic? Like, how does it eliminate the friction in the data workflow? How does what is its magic? Um, so, uh, like all the other orchestration tools, um, we we build out a DAG um, of, of tasks, essentially, of things to do. And um, we, whenever you execute something inside of Shipyard, uh, kind of the main thing that happens is all of, all of the code that runs or um, all of these tasks that you ask us to run for you, they all run in a containerized uh, uh, system. And all of the data that gets stored and shared um, in every single one of those runs is on an ephemeral file storage. Um, so, and then all of that happens in the cloud and is entirely managed for you. So um, 
to to start uh, removing friction, it is not requiring data teams to understand how to manage cloud resources, what a Linux server is, how to run things like that, how to host your own solution. Um, because we are entirely cloud-based uh, and we run everything for you, uh, we can prevent some of that DevOps friction up front. And then uh, we have various features like installing packages for you, collecting output, um, uh, version control, um, other things like that, that really are engineering best practices, but applied to the uh, the data ecosystem. And so uh, as, as things run or the kind of the tools or the enhancements that we make to just normal data workflows, uh, uh, we try to do as much for the user as possible and make everything as easy as possible um, so that if you have an idea or if you have something working on your local machine, it's as seamless as possible and as fast as possible to get it running uh, on our platform. Okay. So, um, you know, while building a product like Shipyard, uh, you know, what are the day-to-day -day technology challenges that you come across? Uh, at a, like, of course, it's open-ended, but some pointers like more, is it more on security? Is it more on scale? Is it more on integrations or APIs or all of these so. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely all of the above, um, but the main ones are uh, scale um, and integrations to a certain extent. Um, uh, you know, we have we have over 60 uh, low code templates or blueprints that are connected to various uh, vendors within the data space. And so that does bring a specific amount of engineering effort where we have to um, test and run and, and keep up to date all of those specific integrations. Um, but that would be kind of the same the same work at any company. I mean, doing an integration with a separate vendor um, is, is going to be work required by anybody to work with those vendors. So we're, that's why we provide those. Um, and so that is a, a section of work that we do, but uh, the main thing, um, for me at least, uh, that is interesting and fun to work on is the scale of it all. And so um, it's 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 much different to be able to run this whole workflow dynamically in the cloud than it is to run a few Python processes on your own local laptop and <clears throat> spitting something out into an Excel file and, and doing things that way. So the way that you have to uh, think about running these workflows and um, and providing the scale to all of our customers and doing that all seamlessly uh, is the is the really fun and difficult part. Right, very well articulated. So, uh, Alex, since you are at the forefront of workflows and uh, uh, you know how they have been evolving, so how do you see the role of data in workflow? evolving in the tech industry in the next five years? How do you see this whole thing shaping up? Yeah. Um, so uh, I must admit, I'm more of the, uh, more on the engineering side of things, less on the data side of things. But I think, uh, I think speed to product um, or the, the least amount of development time for engineering teams um, is going to be uh, more and more valuable as as just the amount of data grows <clears throat> that companies are dealing with, the faster that you can iterate on something or uh, allow those business users or those non-technical users to action on the data, um, the better. Uh, um, and I, I really think that it is actioning on that data and doing things with it versus understanding where it is, what it is, <clears throat> um, where it's living is is growing in importance. Um, it's one thing to say, you know, let's pull this Excel report once a week and look at the numbers and uh, and and know what's happening in the business. It's another thing to say, um, <clears throat> we we are continually ingesting this data and we are continually based on those numbers adjusting things up and down the funnel so that we can continue and always on an automated basis um, 
kind of always be improving things. Uh, so that, I mean, actioning on data, I think is a big, big thing that, that will be happening um, uh, in the next few years. And then um, <clears throat> kind of in general in the technology space, AI and ML, um, I mean, things related to chat GBT and all these, um, all these tools that have come out, um, really lowering the bar to not only lowering the bar to entry into the technology world, um, but also for people that already understand the space or already work in the space, um, being a great kind of sidekick or tool that you can use to really speed up, um, speed up the development process, whether it's engineering or data analysis or whatever you're doing in technology space. Um, I think the advent of AI and ML um, is obviously it's not going anywhere and it's just going to make things faster. Um, right. That's my cat. Sorry. No worries. So um, I think uh, tell us more about your engineering practices like internally. So how large is the team? How do you manage them? What are the best practices that have worked to make the team more productive? Tell us more on those lines. Yeah. Um, so the team started with uh, just myself, and then we've expanded to um, three other engineers. Two of them, uh, their title is full stack, but we have one who uh, likes to work on the back end, and we have another who likes to work on the front end, and then we have a QA engineer as well. And um, that has been the hardest part of uh, of doing this whole shipyard thing is doing something by yourself or in a team of one or two where you are doing most of the work yourself. Uh, I'm sorry if I hold her, maybe she'll be quiet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's been one of the hardest things is, is learning how to do it um, on a team of four or five, 10, 15, however many people will grow into versus just yourself doing all of the work. Um, and so some of the best practices that we that we see or that I try to um, abide by are getting the process to do as much as possible for itself. Um, one of our engineers um, has said that getting the process to document itself or to automate itself um, as much as possible is something that's very beneficial. Um, you know, you can have defined processes, but there's also kind of a knowledge share that comes with that where somebody onboards or comes in and you have to know where to look or you have to know how to train somebody. But as much as you can kind of answer questions for the developers or have the day-to-day -day of the developers be kind of as seamless as possible or um, not something that really has to be learned or more, more integrated into what they're already doing um that that becomes really beneficial um yeah i think <laughs> okay uh, so uh i think tell us more about uh, the day-to-day -day, uh developer metrics that you guys measure around develop productivity like developer velocity and developer say user stories or like how do you measure developer productivity or that? Yeah. Um, so we aren't do you doing agile sprints or what do you use? I'm sorry. Do you, do you run agile sprints or can that... Yeah, we, we, we do agile, um, sprints, iterations, whatever you want to call them. Um, everybody has their own brand, but yeah, we, um, we use iterations, uh, in shortcut, uh, we use shortcuts to manage, um, all of our work and we do, uh, we do our iterations in one week increments, not two or larger. Um, we've found that just kind of having that tighter loop, that tighter feedback loop allows us to be a little bit more focused and, and prevent things from kind of uh, expanding or, you know, scope creep, all those things that happen as, as time progresses. Um, as far as metrics that we track, um, we could be doing a better job of that. Uh, we have all of the information kind of as raw data inside of Shortcut and GitHub and, and all these various tools, but that's not something that uh, 
that we're pulling on a regular basis or looking at on a regular basis. That's something that uh, will be a focus for us um, to to pull and use that data. Um, one thing that we've started to do is uh, kind of take the whole quarter as a chunk um, or take each quarter chunk by chunk and plan all of that out so that um, instead of doing kind of sprint by sprint planning or being a little uh, kind of more agile in that way, we know what we want from the business perspective um, quarter by quarter. And so having all of that planned out and agreed upon uh, at the outset and having all of that knowledge shared and that context provided um, to all of our engineers, uh, I think will be a huge benefit. Um, and then kind of one of the other things that we're starting to do or uh, uh, want to start focusing on is is taking down all of those unit, all of all of our stories and making them as small as possible, something that you can do in a day um, so that you're always getting those dopamine hits of closing stories and, and submitting your PRs. Um, so yeah, just really trying to focus on um, making everything context aware and bite-sized pieces. Uh, that's something that, um, that, that, that I've had to learn that is required to do all of this in a team environment versus yeah. an individual environment. Great, great. So um, another aspect that, you know, we've often come across, you know, talking with different technology leaders is managing the clean code practices or the code quality. So right. what has been your practice in being able to address that aspect? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's a always a fun one. We, in an ideal world, obviously there are no bugs and everything is clean and perfect and um we don't even have this to talk about but obviously that's not the case uh i i think that doing refactoring for the sake of refactoring can be a little dangerous but at the same time i think when a pull request is open or when you're doing something and you're already working on a story um is the perfect time when you've already dug in a little bit to make all of those changes that need to happen. So uh, continuous improvement to the code. And uh, if you see something, fixing something right then and there, obviously depending on the size of the issue, um, if it takes an hour versus a week, um, that may be, you know, throw off timelines and things like that. But uh, we, we, we encourage uh, all of those improvements to happen um, as close to normal development work as possible. Um, but again, all of that to say, this stuff does pile up and it does it does stick around. So one thing that we uh, are starting this year is every quarter we're going to do a, uh, a bug week. So the only thing that we work on that week is trying to squash as many bugs as possible. And then uh, alongside that, we have what we're calling a cruft week, which is essentially a week where the only thing that we try to do is pay down technical debt. And um as it were uh I the bug week, yes, was effective. We're actually in the middle of our cruft week right now. Okay. Um so it is uh we we got some well we obviously got buy-in from uh Blake and the product team. Um the the obvious negative or kind of alarm that that goes off is well how are you going to get any product features out and, and things like that. And the product does right. kind of sit idle for two weeks, but um, the the two weeks are uh, so much different from normal development that it's just a nice change of pace. Uh, I think it's a good uh, morale boost for our developers. It's fun to see the, to see the bugs go away. And in, in my opinion, working on paying down technical debt is I think kind of the funnest part of development, I think refactoring and figuring out how to make things better um, is something I really enjoy. So from from a morale perspective or, you know, at the end of the week, looking back and seeing all this stuff that was annoying you is no longer there um, is always a good feeling. And it just kind of will help accelerate everything in the future. 
So to be determined, um, we're in the middle of the experiment right now. <laughs> sure, keep us posted <laughs> how that one goes. Maybe a comments to the video <laughs> as it goes okay. out. Yeah. Great, great, Alex. So uh, yeah, my last question would be like uh, your vision of shipyard ending in 2023 and then in five years down the line. So where are you taking the company? Yeah. Um, great question. Um, I want, I want shipyard to be kind of the de facto standard for, for data orchestration. I mean, when you think of, um, team communication, you think of Slack, when you think of, uh, you know, free email, you think of Gmail. Now I want shipyard to be, you know, kind of the go-to or the de facto answer for that's when nice. a data engineer or you know a business user is looking for some sort of solution that is based on just the the massive amount of data that exists in a company, um, uh, I want I want Shipyard to be um, kind of that kind of that go to thought. And so for me, um, from a founder's perspective and from a technology and engineering perspective, um, that means just continuing to produce the best product that we can, um, continuing to use engineering best practices and, and, and be able to scale, scale our platform, um, as we, as we continue to grow and, um, just do it as best as we can. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, having, having these good developer foundations, um, and, uh, you know, building it the right way is going to be, uh, we'll lay the foundation for eventually everything else to come. Um, I, I think that um, building things the right way, uh, yeah, again, is 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 the foundation to to help everything else that comes. Um, I'm not. That's what I'm focused on is is building the technology correctly, and then um, I think kind of everything else is a consequence of that. Of course, of course, technology is always the foundational part and doing things the right way. I think yeah. that's in our hands. Great, Eric. Thank you so much for this lovely interview, speaking about all the different aspects of uh, shipyard technology and uh, a lot of technology lessons otherwise. So thank you so much. And to our audience, uh, feel free to subscribe and follow the video link to get even more similar and uh very informational videos. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time.